Hello, I'm Helen Arney. I'm Matt Parker. I'm Steve Mould, and you're listening to a podcast of Unnecessary Detail, a podcast where we talk in detail about the details behind the details. Yes, it's details all the way down. In this detailed episode, we'll be talking about input and output, which means I'll be discussing an algorithm that won an Oscar. I'll be explaining how computers talk to each other behind our backs and how that's actually a good thing. I'm talking about one of my songs, which Steve thinks is the funniest I've ever written, and how it wasn't actually me that wrote it. What? Yeah. I feel a bit betrayed, to be honest. Yeah, I'm sorry, Steve. Let's do some details. So this episode is input and output. Uh, Steve, what are you putting in and what are you getting out? (laughs) So I want to talk about this video that I made a while back. It's a YouTube video. And if you look at the thumbnail of the video, it's got text on it. It says something like, this video has 526,243 views. And that's always right. So whenever you go to the video and look at the thumbnail, the text on the screen will match the number of views that the video actually has. And how many has uh, Tom Scott's equivalent video had? We don't talk about that. Oh. Actually, we, we, you know, we sort of talk about it. So um, I had this idea to make a video where the number of views is written on the thumbnail because Tom Scott previously had made a video where the number of views is in the title of the video. And I thought, well, what's a bit harder than that? <laughs> making the thumbnail match instead of the title. So the title of my video is actually the number of likes that the video has, and it compares it to Tom's. So it says, this video has 62,325 likes, which is 3 million less than Tom's. (laughs) (laughs) Because his videos are the tens of millions. It is. I think it's like 40 million on on his. Can we just acknowledge before we start that at, at one level, this is deeply underwhelming. Because what you're saying is, if you look at that page on YouTube, there's a number here, but it's also (laughs) slightly above as well. Yeah, I get that that's underwhelming. But I guess if you know what the challenge is, then it's interesting. But yeah, on paper, it's like, well, who cares? But this is a podcast of unnecessary detail. So if this isn't something we can talk about on the podcast, I literally have no idea what we can talk about. Tom mentions this in his video. Like, what's the best way to achieve that? You could hire someone to just refresh the page and you know and every time the view count changes they log into your youtube account and change the title and the thumbnail of the video (laughs) (laughs) that's one way to do it or slightly better but only slightly better is to get some software to write some software that does that so you write some code that refreshes the web page the code looks for the view count on the web page and then the software that you've written logs into your YouTube account and changes the thumbnail and the title. If you do that, that's called web scraping. And if you're a software developer that does web scraping, it's basically an exercise in just being frustrated and then it breaks. <laughs> because there's a bit on the page, an HTML tag that, that holds the view count. So you have to tell the software to find that tag but it won't just be the view count it'll be like it'll say views colon space and then so you gotta get rid of that bit and then you're left with the number but it's got commas in it you gotta get rid of the commas otherwise your software's not gonna understand it and then a week later youtube slightly changes the layout of its web page and your software's broken i did it that way and it broke so i can absolutely confirm that you did that <laughs> well I had a web scraper. Because I was doing videos on my channel and on Numberphile, I wanted a spreadsheet that would add them all together, all the videos I'd done. So I could I could put in the ID codes for all these videos. My software would load them up in a browser, scrape the whole page. And like you're saying, Steve, it would search for the word views. Yeah. And then back up in the position in in the like the massive string of text from this website it would back up until it finds some digits and then keep backing up until there were no more digits and then go forwards <laughs> writing down the digits ignoring commas but wouldn't it be easier for programmers if youtube made that information available in a way that was easy for software to read like a web page is easy for humans to read can we present the data but 
differently in a way that's good for software. And that solution is called an API, an application protocol interface, and it's revolutionized computing. APIs dominate our lives and we never really think about them. Like these days, if you're a computer that has data, it often makes sense to have an API as well. For example, Transport for London, they have loads of data about arrival times and things like that. So for example, if you go to Transport for London, you can look up when's the next bus at this particular bus stop. And it's a, a nice website and it's human readable and it looks easy on our eyes. But if you take the URL of that website, it's going to be something like tfl.gov.uk forward slash buses forward slash bus stop forward slash, you know, and there's like the code for that bus stop. If you take that URL and just change it a little bit, but you, you keep the code for the bus stop, instead of getting this really nice web page, you just get this block of text. And it looks like code, you know, it's got like square brackets, curly brackets, colons, things like that, because it's not for human eyes. It's not a web page, it's just text and numbers that is easy for software to understand. So behind the real website, there's another secret website yeah. that, that, that computers use instead of the, the human friendly one. Yeah. But only yeah. if someone set it up like that. Someone's got to think, what if a computer wants to get the bus? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, com computers what? haven't set up like their version of Facebook. So hang on, is this something to do with bus watch, Steve? Because uh, I'm just remembering when we used to yeah. meet in real life back in the before <laughs> times, uh, you used to have a, a watch, like a smartwatch, and you'd look at your watch yeah. and be like, bus leaving in seven minutes. And we'd be like, <laughs> is he doing that? So I did use the TFL API because there's a bus stop outside my house. The bus comes every about 10 minutes, but there's no system to it um so it's nice to be able to look it up and see when's the next bus as i'm running around the house trying to get ready i can see on my watch because I, I wrote an app for my pebble watch that consumes the tfl api and just shows me on my watch look it's five minutes before the next bus stop there's another one after that which is 11 minutes away and so i know that i've got like three minutes to get ready and get out of the house down to the bus stop. So I love APIs because they're fun to play with and you can write software that uses them. And it's, I mean, it's everywhere. It's like, uh, you know, we have a, a Shopify store. We sell stuff and that has an API. Maskgear.com. Yeah. And uh, uh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, that, no, I wasn't which, talking about which Mastia. one did you choose? Which one did you choose uh, to say there? The one that I knew you wouldn't mention, <laughs> so I thought I would. Uh... <laughs> You're just like, oh, let's ignore that. This is a festival of the spoken nerd podcast. Oh yeah, festival of the spoken nerd dot com slash shop slash buses. <laughs> a really good example of how APIs have changed the way we do things is Amazon. Like in the early days, back when they were just selling books and losing money, Jeff Bezos decreed from on high that from now on, different departments aren't allowed to ask each other for information. Like if you're in the marketing department, you can't go over to the sales department and say, look, can you give me the numbers on the sales of blah, blah. You're not allowed to do that anymore. If you want the information, the sales department have to write an API for accessing that data. And you in the marketing department have to write software that uses that API and pulls the information and displays it to you. And Jeff Bezos said, if you don't do that, you're fired. And that was genuinely the culture. Like people were scared of being fired. So everyone did it. And what it meant was like, you might have someone over here in Amazon who's in charge of like building the software that puts books online for sale and that person has written an API for, for using that stuff. And then someone else in a different department thinks, well, you know what? I mean, we could use that API to sell jewelry. And so suddenly Amazon is selling jewelry as well as books. That's how Amazon got to the point of like selling it like anything they want to. It meant that they learned a lot of lessons like internally because someone would produce an API that was really useful for accessing some of the data that they have. So someone else in another department is like, right, I'm just going to query that API every second and have it displayed on my computer but it's like but it's really computationally expensive you know whatever that query is and someone else in another department hears about how useful it is so they start doing it every second and suddenly 
your server crashes. So they need to start worrying about quotas and or, you know, authentication and you know spam. So if someone uses an API, yeah. depending on how it's set yeah. up, the the website or the computer that you're querying has to do some computational work. Yeah, exactly. Like let's say someone's needlessly. I don't know, ping in YouTube because they want to update their thumbnail or something. <laughs> right? That's adding additional load onto, onto someone else's computer system, which is going to cause problems. Yeah. So, so for example, like, I, I would like to have my thumbnail update every five seconds, but I'm not allowed because I have a quota. And you can actually go in the back end of Google's API and you can see what different things cost. <laughs> so like looking up the view count costs you 10 points and uh, updating a, a title of a video costs 10 points let's say but i've only got 10,000 points a day available to me or something like that so i can i can't remember the numbers that's definitely wrong but basically i'm only allowed to update the thumbnail and title once every i think it's 5 or 10 minutes i hit the google sheets api limit on my christmas tree <laughs> pardon cuz i had <laughs> I had the 500. Remember, I had the 500 LED Christmas tree where I could program all these crazy lighting effects in 3D yeah. on my Christmas tree, and I put a, a video out on it. During the year, I got bored, and so I linked it to a Google Sheet. And then when I, because when I was doing talks online, I would share the Google Sheet with the people watching the talk, and they could go and put RGB values in the <laughs> spreadsheet, and then my tree would change to match the colors that were in the spreadsheet. I am enjoying the assumption that people will have time and inclination to go and do something in a spreadsheet rather than listen to your talk. <laughs> oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I know my audience very well. I, uh, you, what, you're saying uh, that you're saying they're really good at multitasking, not that they aren't interested in your talk. At doodling in a spreadsheet. Well, actually I underestimated the interest because I oh. thought a few people would go and do this. <laughs> The spreadsheet was inundated with people. <laughs> and I was, foolishly, I coded it. I was API asking for one cell at a time. And when everything kicked off in the spreadsheet, Google's like, nah, mate, too many requests and, and shut it down. Wow. I had to rewrite the software. Now you can just get the whole spreadsheet at once, bring it all back and then do the analyzing at my end. And I, don't, I didn't, I don't know what the points allocation is for that, Steve, but <laughs> Google was way happier with me just getting the whole thing at once and then dealing with it myself ah. versus getting the cells individually from them. Wow. APIs, not just for Christmas, guys. Mm. No. That's exactly right. What's interesting, just to bring it back to the story of Amazon, is that they dealt with all these problems that naturally come with APIs. And it got to the point where they could then make these APIs available to the public. So not only is Amazon selling books and jewelry and tools and whatever, I can now sell on an Amazon using their API. What that means is, right, our Shopify account, Festival of the Spoken Nerd, has an API because it's based on Shopify. Shopify has an API. You can get Shopify's API to talk to Amazon's API, and now we can sell our stuff on Amazon as well as on our Shopify website because of APIs. And what's crazy is all of these different things that Amazon are doing, selling products, it's all based on websites, right? You, you buy and sell on the Amazon website. And this website has APIs as well. So now if you want to build a website and host it somewhere, you can host it on Amazon servers. It's called Amazon Web Services. And more than half of Amazon's profits are from Amazon Web Services. So, you know, you think of Amazon as a company that sells products, and they do that, but most of their profit comes from hosting websites. You can't avoid them. Like, if you wanted to boycott Amazon, let's say you think they're, they've got a toxic work environment that fires people for talking to each other and not using an API, <laughs> and you want to avoid Amazon, you can't, like, even right now, because we're, we're talking over Zoom while we're recording mm -hmm. remotely for this podcast, Zoom chats are hosted by Amazon Web Services. Oh, you're kidding. Like you said, Netflix, like, you cannot avoid AWS. You can't. I mean, the, you know, the biggest thing is, is LinkedIn. How, how, you know, how can you wean yourself off LinkedIn? I mean, how would I network? How would you network how otherwise? The BBC? uses uh, Amazon, even Facebook uses Amazon for some things, Twitter. All this made me think that maybe we should have an API 
for this particular podcast episode. Like, I'm sure we could code something up. Oh. <laughs> like, maybe some sort of comparative thing between me and Matt. So, because we're both on YouTube and YouTube has an API. That's what I was thinking. And we've both got about a million subscribers. It's about a million, so we could track um, how much more I have than you, for example. Whoa! I mean, <laughs> that could be a negative value. Just you it know, it could be. I would probably. I think we have to. It depends on how I code it. It might crash if it goes negative. Who knows? We could do it as a ratio. <laughs> yeah, assuming that I actually build this API, which I will. Then let's say the URL is going to be festivalofthespokennerd.com forward slash API. I'll also leave a link to that in the show notes. If you go to festivalofthespokennerd.com forward slash podcasts, you can find it there as well. Um, I did actually look at, because I was looking at, you know, how did Jeff Bezos get so rich? I did start to think, you know, this expression, uh, raking it in, if you're raking it in, how much is, how much is he raking in? I made an assumption of one rake per four seconds or something like that. I worked out that if you crumpled up $100 bills and laid them like one layer crumpled up on the floor, tightly packed, and you were raking that, then you would rake in as much as Jeff Bezos is raking in. Matt, do you have any input? I mean, what I'm saying is what's your output? I have some random output. I mean, more what? so, more so than usual. Yeah, I've I've come <laughs> with the uh, random noise that won an Academy Award. So this is Oscar award-winning randomness, which I find oh. deeply pleasing, and it kind of makes sense because if it, it's uh, often in life, randomness is good, particularly if you're trying to simulate nature. So if you want something to look organic, it can't be too systematic, or it looks artificial. Um, it's also useful in things like playing games and whatnot. You want to have s- some randomness. And uh, before we even start, I just want to deal with one problem. I'm going to say randomness. I'm going to say things that are random. I'm often talking about things that are pseudo random because the downside to true random is it's unpredictable and it can't be repeated. So mm. if you were, I don't know, developing a new snakes and ladders game and you want to test it, you could roll a dice over and over to get your results. But then you, you afterwards, you'd be like, well, I don't have any record of that. And if someone else tests it, they're going to get something different. So what you could do is just have a big book where someone's previously rolled a dice over and over and over again. And then you follow along in the book with those results. And that's good for debugging and testing things because it's always the same. Matt, are you trying to hint at what your next book is going to be? You used to be able to buy <laughs> random numbers in a book. <laughs> And the Did reviews you? online are like, like obviously, <laughs> people are like, still a better love story than Twilight, all that stuff, you know. Wow. Uh, <laughs> it's, the reviews on books of random numbers are glorious. It's, it's the internet at their finest. But sadly now, it tends to be you'll find some mathematical function that generates numbers with the same distribution and properties of, of a pure random number. Uh, like a dice or a coin or something, but it's repeatable, predictable, and so it's it's way easier if you're debugging, testing something, repeating anything. You got more than one person working on it. You want pseudo random. So is it a bit like if you used or the first however many digits of pi or something, which is like irrational, randomish? I mean, maybe that doesn't yeah. fit the bill, but it's a fixed thing that someone else can go. Oh, I'll use that, and when I test my thing with these random numbers, I'll get the same amount of randomness yeah exactly exactly that because people often associate randomness with being unpredictable and different no it can be predetermined but still function as a random variable so one of the features of the award-winning random noise is it's always the same if you look up the same bit you'll always get the same thing and I'll, i'll explain more about that in a moment can i just check whether academy award winning randomness is the harshest film review in history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's avant-garde Dadaism filmmaking. It's like, this is the <laughs> random noise that you will then implement in a film. And actually, it came out of work on the uh, 1982 film Tron. It didn't win a prize for a film it was in. They had these separate Academy Awards for like technical achievement And the noise specifically, the algorithm that generates this noise, won the award. 
It wasn't the implementation what? of it. It wasn't its use in a film. The, the noise itself was Academy Award winning. That's insane. That's amazing. An Academy Award just for nerdy noise. It's great. <laughs> I'm working on a, a YouTube video about this noise because a friend of ours, Seb Lee Delisle, who does massive laser installations, invited me up to see a huge installation he did in Leeds recently where he was lasering lightning bolts onto a building. Absolutely amazing. But in the cool. process of working on that, I was like, oh, I want to be able to visualize this noise. So I was generating 2D noise animations to use in the video. Whenever my wife walked into the room, I'd be like, hey, Lucy, look, I've just made an, an Academy Award winning film. I'm like, <laughs> Do you want to see my latest Oscar winning animation? And you might think she'd get tired of that, but you're wrong. Hey, she started tired of that. Just... <laughs> Out of the gates. <laughs> so the reason Seb was using it is he wanted to have a lightning bolt that was like zigging and zagging backwards and forwards. But he wanted that to look like an organic lightning bolt. And so what you can do, if you're ever faced with a situation where you don't want pure randomness, you want more organic randomness, is you go to, I imagine it as like, like Narnia for randomness. It's like a magical land where you can go and you can retrieve randomness. And in the two-dimensional case, you can imagine it as a landscape of hills and troughs and valleys and ups and downs. And what you do is you pick a location in the magical world of randomness, and then you measure its altitude, and that's your random number. And it means mm. if you want a series of random numbers that naturally move, from, like depend on the previous one, but they fluctuate in a nice, continuous, non-jarring fashion, you pick a starting point in the magical land of randomness, and then you start moving in a direction. And as you walk along, you keep track of the, how the altitude's changing, and that's your changing variable. So what Seb was mm. doing was uh, defining a path, or like a, a, a route you can walk in the magical randomness land, and then moving that path sideways. And so the path was his lightning bolt going backwards and forwards. He was using the altitude to change how far it was going from side to side. And then by moving it sideways through time, that would animate it. So as it went to the side, that would cause it all to wobble backwards and forwards. The reason why that's so much better than normal random noise is normal randomness. It would just be jumping all over the shop because each point doesn't depend on the previous one whereas if you've got nice smooth continuous noise then it moves backwards and forwards nice and seamlessly i feel like i have a solution to oh. the random jumping around oh hey, yep yep hit me with and it and it's a simple one i just i want to share it but then again if i keep it secret then maybe i can win an you academy, get an academy award, award. <laughs> yeah tell do, Steve. do you know what i'll tell look yeah. i'll tell you this is I'll, you I'll stamping let, I'll, your I'll, name on it yeah yeah i'll give it to the world okay yep. You already have your random line, which is the lightning. Yep. And when you animate it, you just use a random number to decide, you know, how much am I going to move it? Instead of just jumping to a new location, you have a range of values that tells you how far is each point on the lightning going to move left or right. And if yeah. you keep that within a nice range, then isn't that a solution? Or have Cl I missed Close, something? close. You've kicked okay. the can one derivative down the road. So now your position... <laughs> We'll move continuously, <laughs> but it's going to be changing direction super erratically. And so oh, the yeah. benefit of using this magical land of noise is it, it'll go one way for a while and then naturally slow down, then come back the other way. Whereas if you've just got a pure mm. randomness changing the direction, it'll just be juddering all over the shop. Although, Steve, you're not far off in that you were thinking... How can we use like randomness to move from one bit to another randomly? You're yeah. not a million miles away from how this noise actually works. And so it's called Perlin noise. Technically, it's now simplex noise because it's been updated and um, it's now more computationally efficient. I still call it Perlin mm -hmm. noise. It's like, you know, I still say I'm going to film a video when I'm not using film anymore i'm just using the original name right so uh, by saying perlin noise all the kids are like all right grandpa but hey <laughs> that's, that's the original the original noise that ken yeah, perlin but... that's why it's named after came up with because of tron perlin's idea was you start with this you've got this landscape that you want to give it some random ups and downs 
So the yeah. technical details, and this is so nice for people who are into this. You put a grid over your landscape. The original Perlin noise used a square grid, and that's actually the difference. Modern simplex noise, same idea, uses a triangle grid, so it splits into triangles. It's actually easier to compute. Fun fact. The original version used a square grid, and you put a random value at every intersection of the grid, and then you use that. The standard random value. The original one just used every possible value and then shuffled them. And the way that you shuffle them was like the seed for then the randomness you had in your landscape. It's actually, you're giving it a random vector that you put at every single Mm. intersection point. And so the original Perlin noise had a finite set of vectors that were then shuffled according to this um, permutation list that uh, Ken came up with. But somehow... You put random vectors at every single corner. And then for the in-between points, you look at the directional vector to all the corners of whichever square you're in in the grid. And you take the dot product of the vector between the point and the corner and the random vector at the corner. And then you've got a way of combining all of those together, like all four or three if you're using triangles to give you your random value at that point. And the way you combine them and weight them is important. So you keep a nice continuous set of values. But the general, like the high order concept is, if you make the randomness at a specific point based on the direction and distance of the corners around it, as you move that point around, the angle to the other corners is changing nice and continuously. So you still got the randomness of the values at the corners, but then you're mixing it with the nice continuous change of the direction to those corners. And don't get me Mm. wrong, it's a non-trivial bit of computing to put it all together, but what you end up with is by assigning these random values at all the corners of the grid, you then get this nice continuous random surface that joins them all together, and that is your Perlin noise, or simplex noise. And you're not limited to two dimensions. You can do the same thing in three dimensions. The original one would use a cube lattice. And simplex noise uses tetrahedra to divide up space. And that's actually why it changed. Each time you go up a dimension, if you're using cubes, you get twice as many corners, twice as many vertices. Whereas if you're using simplexes, which is the generalized name for a triangle in any dimension, you've only got one extra vertex per dimension. And so if you're computing it in higher dimensions, it's way less additional computation compared to the original Perlin noise. Because cubes have eight corners and tetrahedra have four. Four, exactly. And a 4D tetrahedron only has five corners, whereas a 4D cube has 16. And... And then so cube corners, like in 5D, you've got 32 corners on your cube. You've only got six on your tetrahedron. So Ooh. it's way, way fewer corners if you can split your space up into higher dimensional triangles versus higher dimensional squares. That is a timely reminder that in my future five dimensional house, everything should be tetrahedral, not, not cuboid, or I will run out of space really soon. Well, it'll just be really hard to compute where to put things. <laughs> oh, yeah. This actually ties into a little project uh, Helen and I did to try and make this a podcast-friendly demonstration of random noise, where Uh I thought I would generate some truly random tunes for Helen to play on the piano and Mm -hmm. some Perlin noise random tunes. I gave Matt a range that I can sing in, so my lowest easy singing note and my highest easy singing note, and I gave him a scale, which uh, was A major or C sharp minor, for any scale fans out there, and uh, initially I gave you a starting note of A, you also did me some C sharps, and I think yep. The, yep. the ones starting on C sharp are the ones that sounded better, and oh, I, nice. you sent me loads of different ones. I found, I think, the most tuneful Perlin one, and I've added gotcha. rhythm and phrasing so it comes across as a melody. And I've, f- this was hard, found the most tuneful random one, and I I did my best. I generated <laughs> equal numbers of each for the record. Yeah, equal numbers of for notes. Fairness. They've come out quite yeah. different. Uh, and our wonderful producer, Lindsay, is is going to play them in for us. Lindsay, can you can you play in the random one first? And, and let's see how tuneful you think this is. Thank 
Thank you very much. I um, mean, I'll take you've made, my Oscar on the way out. <laughs> you've made something from not a lot. I got to give it to you. <laughs> I mean, yeah. To call it jazz is a disservice to jazz, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so it's very freestyle. <laughs> it's super freestyle. And the thing that's noticeable is it it jumps everywhere. It goes to like the highest note in my mm. range. It goes to the lowest note in my range, and everywhere in between, it, it completely randomly. Um, the Perlin one was so much easier and more pleasant to set as a tune and I hope uh, to listen to. Lindsay, can we play that one? I mean, I'm not going to say it's like hands in the air, C-H-O-O-N tune, but I hope that you, you can better. hear it. It's like, it's better. Yeah. It, yeah. It, like it, I got a, I got a feeling from it. You know what I mean? Oh, thank it's like, you. Oh, it's like a, it's like, so it's melancholy, you know, yeah. whereas the other one, it's like, anyway. well, I guess the notes are in that key, but it's like, <laughs> I'm not really getting a feeling from it. Steve, you've summarized the, the difference, the random one it's got all the signals that it's a melody and it jumps yeah. around, but the Perlin one actually makes you feel something. Yeah. Even though it's randomly generated, it actually feels natural. It feels like it's been crafted. It's an unbelievable difference, huge difference, I think, mm. between the two. Award-winning difference. Thank you. <laughs> As always, I mean, what gives it its natural feel is the previous like the next note like it's randomness but it depends on the previous note because it's a con coming mm. from a continuous function and what's interesting about Perlin noise compared to true randomness is because it's based on these grid corners there's a, a scale different meaning of the word scale there's a scale to Perlin noise so when Helen and I were working out how to turn Perlin noise into, into music we had to decide how far we would move through the randomness landscape before sampling the random variable again and then moving it. Because if you mm. if you don't move much at all, it'd be the same note over and over and over and over again. If you move too far, you're back to pure randomness because you're skipping so far ahead in the landscape. It has no, mm. no resemblance to where you just were. And so we ended up, the tune you heard, we were moving half a grid length between each note but we weren't moving in the direction of the grid we were moving on a weird angle through the 3d noise one of the things about this random noise and the reason it is award-winning is when it's used properly you don't even notice it because it means you can procedurally generate very natural looking organic scenes and done properly it just looks like the thing it looks like so in the pixar film brave the forests were generated using random noise and I actually, I passed over this briefly before where I talk about how you, you can have a seed for your randomness. It's like choosing what dice you want to roll or something. The number you put in that then determines what pseudo randomness you get out. And in the Brave film, they used one of the developer's phone numbers was the seed for the random noise that then generated the forests in the background. <laughs> And in the code, like when they're writing the code for this, they put a comment next to it. So they've got like the seed equals and then their phone number. And then there's a comment right next to it that says, call me if you don't understand this. So if anyone came across, <laughs> like, like, oh, how do I explain random, like pseudo random noise in a seed? I know. I'll just make my phone number the seed. And then if anyone gets stuck on it, they'll give me a call. And, we'll, and it looks nice. like a phone number. And we'll deal with it. The issue is that developer uh, changed their phone number. And so they, they dutifully went back and changed the random seed. And that no. meant, because the seed is different, the forests were completely, <laughs> completely changed. They still looked <laughs> natural. They still looked very similar. But they had, like, totally altered the way they look because they now were using a different random number seed. And um, <laughs> apparently there, there was, uh, in their words, uh, uh, that created some panic in a handful of teams for about half a day across two films. All the vegetation of two films that were in production suddenly changed. 
Because oh, <laughs> the developer changed their phone number. <laughs> that was the random seed. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org. I sometimes find myself searching for courses on Brilliant.org when I'm researching something for a show. And it's great to find one because then I have an excuse to do brilliant puzzles at work instead of just in my free time, like when I'm lying in bed or I'm on the toilet. It's got an app as well, so you can do it on your commute or when you're out and about. And it's the best way to learn new things because you learn by doing. With Brilliant, you work through these puzzles and problems They're really fun and really satisfying, and by the end, you've learned something new. There's this really enjoyable cycle of, ooh, that's challenging. Oh, I get it. And you're going to keep going through that cycle, basically, until you really understand something. They've got courses on broad topics like geometry and logic, or you can dive into something like quantum computing or cryptocurrency. You can start using Brilliant for free today, and if you want to sign up, the first 200 people to go to brilliant.org forward slash A-P-O-U-D will get 20% off a full year of STEM learning. Well, Steve's given us computer inputs and I've had some random outputs to tie it all together. Helen, what have you got? My job is pretty much to uh, take inputs and turn them into outputs. Uh, That is that's what I do when the input is information and the output is a song, right? So um, I sometimes get asked to write songs using this um, creative scientific system. Uh, and I got commissioned by BBC Radio 3 to write a song for their wonderful show called The Verb, uh, which they wanted me uh, to co-write and create the ultimate uh, love song. And I was like, this is my kind of commission. I'm going to use a scientific method to create the ultimate love song, which is going to be the absolute best love song that resonates with the maximum possible number of people across the globe, right? Um, But I obviously didn't want to share my meagre BBC standard contributor fee with an actual human co-writer because toddler shoes don't buy themselves. (laughs) And I picked my co-writer and my co-writer is an algorithm or more specifically, a series of algorithms uh, to be even more specific, but actually slightly vague at the same time. I picked my co-writer to be a popular internet search engine that rhymes with bugle. (laughs) Bing doesn't rhyme with bugle. (laughs) Uh, I mean, neither does Google. But anyway, so I searched for the most popular love song lyrics that I could find on Google, right? And and because of the way that Google uses algorithms, it serves up things that other people have been looking for and have found useful. It serves up things influenced by your settings, by your location, your language. It serves up things that are globally happening in that moment, Right. Uh, And so this song, when I wrote it, was a co-written song that myself and the algorithm believed was full of stuff that people were truly looking for in a love song. Right. So I found loads and loads of love song lyrics and put them all into a song thinking that this would create the ultimate love song. It didn't go quite as I thought <laughs> and I've actually got a live recording of this song so I'm gonna play out this live recording now this is from Ada Lovelace Day Live which I hosted a couple of years ago and uh, Ada Lovelace Day Foundation are fantastic they do loads of supporting women in science and technology and networking and mentoring and resources and stuff all the year round so go and check them out because they've let me use this recording um, because as you listen to it you will realize why <laughs> <laughs> this needs to be performed in front of an audience of more than two people. Um, so I present to you the ultimate algorithmically enabled love song ever written. Love, oh, love. Love, sweet love. Love. How can I mend a broken heart? How can I tell you how I feel? And how can I make you love me? I just want to hold you close. Just want to make you happy. But I can't find the words to say I love you. We shared a night together. Tell me when will I see you again? 
loving you is easy let's make this moment last because i'm loving this feeling when you wish upon a star it makes no difference who you are if you don't say you love me all you need is love and i think So please, let me love you. Okay. Now I've got to tell you, I was pretty disappointed. <laughs> Because every single one of those lines taken individually is a love song classic. But when you put them together, it creates something quite bland. And I don't think that's a good love song. So I thought, actually, right, if you take out of the search algorithm all of the lines that are already in other love songs, maybe that creates a song about what people are really looking for. So I did exactly the same search again. I searched for the beginning of every line, but instead of taking the first returned search, I took the second one. So I've rewritten the song to be about what we're all really looking for. Love is a verb. Love, actually, love, Island 2018. Love, lace, comma, Augusta Ada's King Noel, comma, Countess of. How can I mend a broken zip? How can I tell what iPhone I have? And How can I make YouTube safer for my child? I just want a hippopotamus for Christmas. Just want to make a phone call and I can't find the format file pdflatux.fmt. We shared a bowl of sugar. Tell me when will I see results from the gym? Loving you is complicated. Let's make America great again. Because I'm loving angles instead. Okay, that's a weird one because uh, that one, <laughs> popular search engines base it on your previous search history as well. I've done a show called Helen Arney, Voice of an Angle. Now my search history is tainted forever. <laughs> oh, when you wish upon a brunch, it makes no difference who you vote for. If you say, oh no, how many cards do you pick up? All you need is love and a dog. And I think I'm in love with myself. <laughs> love is in the hair. So please let me Google that for you. Honestly, I'm amazed at your skill of creating, like the first half, like if I heard that in the charts, I'd be like, yeah, that's a pop song, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's wow. A, you, that's a song about love. You have no, you know? uh, the, I'm, Steve, I would question your discernment of what is a good pop song, but then I know that <laughs> oh, you I'm like- not saying it's good. I'm <laughs> not right. saying it's good. I'm just saying <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised to see it there. <laughs> That's okay. All right, that's dif yeah. that's different and that's fine. <laughs> that's just more about Steve's opinion of popular music than, than yeah. your song. It definitely does. Yeah. I look back at writing that song and that was in 2018, which was at the most fulsome time of the American elections where something weird happened every time I, I re-googled because sometimes I sort of re-googled the lines to see if I could get a better version at a different time of day and weirdly when it was in the middle of the night in America I would write the line let's make and it would offer me let's make a baby together oh, wow. but when America was awake it would offer me let's make America great again so it proved to me that actually yeah the the events that are happening globally and locally do change what you get back. I get Let's Make a Deal. Do you? Are you Googling yeah. my song in real time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing a remix. I hope you don't mind. 
You are doing the 2021 post-COVID remix. 2021 Matt Search History remix. I think uh, <laughs> my on-the-record opinions of the maths behind Deal or No Deal, maybe? Is, is that... <laughs> no, Let's Make a Deal is an American television show. Is so it? a lot of people are searching for it, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it because I, I, this is very much of its time, right? I, if we tried to Google every single line of the song, we would get quite different things for yeah. some of them, depending on current events, and yeah. we would get quite classic things for others, right? Because if you imagine, right, if you're in Britain, where we are now, and you Google the word Latin, like if you do that now, you'll get like the classic language of the Roman Empire. But if you Google yeah. that in Texas on the border of Mexico, you're going to get quite a different answer. One would expect, like, I am not there right now. But Latin has a different connotation depending on where you are in the world and what global events are happening, right? If I put let's make art, I also get let's make art, but I also get let's make Africa green again, followed by yeah. let's make America great again. So wow, yeah. I, that just tells you how far that phrase has fallen in in popularity globally and locally making africa green yeah. again is more important than making america great again it's cop 26 <laughs> week when we're recording this seems so obvious True. now i say that right Ooh, the algorithms know what's happening yeah what's another beginning line how can i mend a broken heart how can i how can <laughs> i watch the fight tonight <laughs> how can i buy bitcoin in the uk <laughs> Yeah. yeah. How, how can, can I mend a zip? A zip? I got I... zip. How can I mend my how marriage? How can I mend a broken relationship? Yeah, mm. some of them go pretty dark pretty quickly. Yeah. I think um I think I'm in love with you, the girl next door, someone, my friend, someone else. That's dark. And I think I'm in love with a girl who works on checkout six in decathlon. <laughs> yeah, I've got that. <laughs> Lyrics. <laughs> Really? It says at the end. Yeah. Ah, Matt, have you put your Google settings onto not culturally aware or something? <laughs> no, it's... No, it's, it's just, just learned it's, that. It's correctly learnt. <laughs> it's like, look, this guy's pretty blissfully unaware of pop culture. Let's keep it that way. <laughs> so uh, I hope everyone has a lot of fun uh, listening to that song. By the way, you, that song is available on our um, Bandcamp uh, page. So if you go to helenani.bandcamp.com uh, you'll find an album of all of the songs that appear on all of the Unnecessary Detail podcasts uh, and you can download them all for free or give us some money if you feel like it but also I would love anyone who has come up with a really good second choice lyric that has changed since I wrote this song if you if you mm. Google the lyrics and you come up with some really good second choices, I would love to hear them. Uh, you can email podcast at festivalthespokenland.com. Uh, you can tweet us or whatever at FOTSN or at Helenani, or you can tweet at Steve and Matt because <laughs> it might help change their search history. <laughs> that, would, that would really help. Well, that is all the output we've got for today's set of inputs. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast, which is part of the Acast Creator Network. Woo! If you want even more details, check out the show notes. They're also available at festivalofthespokennerd.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find links to the videos we've mentioned in this episode, free downloads of Helen's songs from the series, probably some free code from me and Matt as well. If you want to have a bit of algorithmic fun in your own time. We would love it if you could rate and review us on iTunes. And by us, we mean the podcast specifically. It actually does make a big difference to how many people get to hear about the podcast. And it may impact how many episodes we can make in the future. And if you have any unnecessary detail for us or some alternative lyrics for me, or just want to get in touch, podcast at festivalofthespokennerd.com is our email. And we're on all the social media, so come and find us and say hi. But for now, we'll say bye. 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 A podcast of unnecessary detail is made by Festival of the Spoken Nerd. That's Helen Arney, Steve Mould and Matt Parker. Our series producer is Lindsay Fenner, who also produced this episode. Our theme music is by Howard Carter, and we're proud to be part of the ACAST Creator Network. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.